This is the Pyramid of Ancient Egypt that we all know. The pyramid is a triangle, so saying that is of course not a problem. However, the pyramid is not a perfect triangle geometrically speaking. The so-called perfect shape is just a concept corresponding to another concept. This is the statement that we commonly agree on, for example, the pyramid is a triangle up to this point. A philosophical question arises from these perfect shapes as a concept in geometry. Are they really existent? This is the issue in medieval scholastic philosophy. The problem of universals and particulars first. We need to understand the essence of these two philosophical terms roughly through some simple examples. The so-called universal represents general concepts. The particular represents specific objects. In the understanding of these terms, you can simply think. The universal is the perfect shape. The particular is the object that carries this concept of shape, for example. The pyramid being a triangle for a long period of time. Philosophers have been debating. Which of the two is the real existence? When we look at the history of Western philosophy, we can discover. The earliest to debate this issue were the ancient Greeks Plato and his disciple Aristotle. Plato advocated that universals are real. He believes that ideas are the highest. It is the most real form of existence. It exists independently outside the human cognitive system. And ideas themselves do not have any tangible manifestations. He believes that ideas are the essence of all individual things. All individual things need to be derived through ideas. Or rather, the world we live in is derived from accidental phenomena derived from ideas. So according to Plato's theory, the perfect triangle is truly existent. The pyramid is just a derivative of this idea. It is just a derivative of accidental phenomena. Even though we can see, the pyramid is not a real existence. On the contrary, the idea behind the pyramid is the real one. Aristotle, on the other hand, believes. Forms exist within individual things. In other words, commonalities exist within images. We can only understand the commonalities through observation and contemplation of images, and recognize the commonalities behind them. However, commonalities cannot exist independently of the things themselves. Although he also agrees with Plato's assertion of the reality of commonalities, he does not believe that commonalities are a higher form of existence than images. In the subsequent Hellenistic era, philosophers began to shift their focus towards ethics concerning real happiness. 800 years later, while translating ancient Greek works, Bruges discovered Philipponus's Introduction to Aristotle's Categories Three key questions pose. The first one being, whether genera truly exist, or are they just a concept in our minds? The second question is, if they do exist, are they material or immaterial? The third question is, whether they exist apart from perceptible things, or in some form within perceptible things, exist within perceptible things, as he translated the work. Bruges once again turned his thoughts. Back to 800 years ago, the debate between Plato and Aristotle's views. He also realized for the first time, the immense difficulty in answering this question. If what we need to verify is, whether human thought corresponds to a reality beyond the mind, then we will soon discover, that in our minds, there are actually many concepts. There are no corresponding external objects to them, such as dragons, mermaids, centaurs, and other creatures imagined by humans although they exist in our mental imagination, but they do not have a presence in the real world, or rather, they do not exist. Including the point imagined by geometers. This is also something we cannot find anywhere in real life, something that cannot be found anywhere. Perhaps many people would think, these monsters are of course fictional, but in life, aren't the concepts of these figures also not real? In this regard, Proclus further explained that he believes, We form concepts in two basic ways, combination and abstraction. For example, the combination of human and fish creates a mermaid. The combination of various animals creates a dragon. This is combination. Abstraction, on the other hand, is from a specific object, extracting a certain attribute from it. Therefore, Proclus believes that concepts are abstracted by us from actual, individual things. So he believes the concept already exists in individual things. When we start thinking about it, the concept emerges. The concept is formed in this way. Exists simultaneously in objects in the mind. Although Plotinus' analysis is limited to forms. But this participation includes not only species and categories, but also other attributes, such as justice, goodness. 
For example, for instance, if there are two completely different trees in front of us, but they are both trees. This is because as objects, they already contain the universal foundation that makes them exist. There is also a mutual resemblance, so we can consider both as trees, because in our minds, we have already abstracted their similarities. Plotinus believed, that participation is both a reality and a concept. It exists in individual things. It is tangible. But when it exists in our thoughts and minds, it is intangible. So participation exists in things, and separates them from each other. According to Plotinus, the answers to the three questions of Porphyry, are then divided into the two camps of the intelligibles and the sensibles. From this perspective, Plotinus was not only the last philosopher of ancient Rome, but also the first philosopher of scholastic philosophy. From the perspectives of science and theology, the issue of participation is related to the debate between faith and knowledge. You might be wondering at this point, what does this have to do with Christianity? Actually, starting from Derrida, Christian nominalists have always emphasized, faith is something reason cannot comprehend. If believers could comprehend God's revelation through reason, then the uniqueness of faith would be diminished by reason. The concept of the incarnation would naturally be weakened by reason. However, Christian idealists have a different perspective. They presuppose a realist position on common issues. So they usually attempt to approach God through reason. They believe our mental concepts correspond to real things. Of course, the debate on commonality is far from being resolved. In the medieval experiential philosophy over 500 years later, Odo once again attempted to prove faith through reason. Even in the Middle Ages, reason became a refuge for faith at one point. Following the development trajectory of Western philosophical history, this fascinating argument will be elaborated on in the subsequent videos. It will also be presented appropriately to everyone. Stay tuned as I take you through a popular look at philosophy. Friends, see you next time.